As people are coming in, I'd like to welcome you all, virtual audience, and also our internal audience formed of award holders and staff here at the BSR. As many of you know, my name is Harriet O'Neill, and I'm Assistant Director for Fine Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences at the BSR. It is my great pleasure to um, not only welcome our audience, but of course our speaker, Yelena Stojkovic, um, who has been with us for almost three, three months now and as our Ballston Fellow, um, and sadly leaves us in June, at the end of June, but she's been a fantastic asset um, to the community, so I'm very grateful to her, and I think you'll hear from her paper why she has been so brilliant at bringing the artists and the humanities scholars together. So a little bit about Yelena before she starts. Um, she's an art historian and critic based in London. She's also a lecturer in photography with critical studies um, as a specialism at Oxford Brookes University. And many of you would may have read or have her book on your reading list, Surrealism and Photography in 1930s Japan, The Impossible Avant-Garde. And that was published by Routledge in 2020. So I'm not gonna take up too much of your time, but hand over to Yelena for her paper, Illumination Abstract Art in a transnational context and remind all audiences that this is being recorded and you're very welcome to send in your questions using the Q&A function and we also um, get questions from our real audience too. So thank you very much, Yelena. Okay, thank you so much, Harriet, and thank you to the BSR for having me and supporting my research. It's been great to be at the BSR the last couple of months. Um, to be in Rome as well. Uh, thank you all for coming and thank you all for watching and listening. Um, the title of my talk today is very much the title of my project here in Rome. So I want to start by unpacking a little bit of that um, wording from the title. So I'm gonna start from uh, what um, I mean there by Illumination, and you will notice the French pronunciation. Um, Illumination was a group um, of several artists living and working in Rome in the 60s. Um, it was comprised of Abenabria from Japan, uh, Mira Birtka and um, Milena Tudrakovic from former Yugoslavia, now Serbia, from um, Aldo Schmidt and Paolo Patelli from Italy, as well as from Marsha Hafi from the US. They were a short-lived collective. They operated between 1967 and 1971, and they only had one show um, in 1967 at L'Argentario Gallery in Trento. And this is the only um, black and white, unfortunately, installation view of that, shot, of that show that we know of. Um, in the exhibition catalogue of uh, this show, Abe, who was the group's leader and the central figure, really much contextualizes the work of the group in terms of its interests, interests towards light and color. So for these artists, light was very much something that was uh, an essential component mm -hmm. of art practice, and it was perceived historically as well as something that was um, very much essential to illuminate it manuscripts or Renaissance painting to Ukiyo-e prints, but also something that also had a kind of a spiritual experience. So he writes there in that sense that um, color is light of a human spirit separated from the rest of nature. It was very much kind of both things that he had in mind when he wrote about light. In terms of color, he sees color as something really joining up these artists together. Their interest in color um, is what he perceives to be kind of the essential element of illumination as a group. The French um, uh, um, pronunciation of a word of the word is uh, very much a nod to his surrealist background. He's somebody who um, is directly quoting Rimbaud and his poetry there, but he's also drawing this very deliberate lineage uh, from art history into the present moment when he speaks about illumination. And I will get back to it as we move along. To introduce a little bit of abstract art in a transnational context, um, in the broadest and shortest terms, um, abstraction in contemporary art is something we 
um, normally perceived to have uh, developed from uh, the turn of the 20th century in European and Russian avant-garde. And then as the kind of art historical narrative goes, it culminated and um, came to its uh, proliferation in the 1950s in um, the US and abstract expressionism. And at this time uh, that we are talking about Illumination in the 1960s, this overwhelming presence of abstract expressionism was a very real thing. It wasn't at that time yet kind of a uh, retrospectively um, uh, 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 imposed uh, narrative, but um, there were a number of state-sponsored uh, uh, exhibitions that traveled around Europe showing abstract expressionist artists such as um, Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko, et cetera. And those would have traveled even to the former Yugoslavia um, at that time in the 1950s. Um, this kind of narrative, of course, then translated into art historical narratives. When we speak about abstract art, we kind of begin, start and end with this conversation. So there has been quite a few incentives in the last couple of years to start and expand this narrative from the point of view of global art practices. And this is the kind of um, example I'm giving here with this book by uh, Pepe Carmel from 2020, and also in um, the from the point of view of women artists. And this is um, the uh, ongoing exhibition at the Pompidou Centre, um, now ongoing in 2021, where um, different kinds of narratives about abstract art are still art historically um, um, uh, starting to emerge and uh, uh, recognize kinds of practices that maybe uh, previously we did not um, uh, consider uh, as thoroughly. So what I want to speak about today is very much the individual artists and their trajectories in Rome from the Illumination Group. And um, I want to do this um, because their very short-lived time in which they existed. So remember 1967 and 1971, if you look at their collective uh, uh, work, there is very little to actually understand. So once we start looking at their work individually, different connections start to emerge, different um, um, kind of interests become clear. So this is kind of the methodology I want to adopt. Um, however, um, I want to immediately say that the Illumination, Illumination as a collective was never a stable uh, collective. There are many reasons for this, but one of them is that the two Italian artists as a matter of fact, did not live in Rome. So the four artists, two from former Yugoslavia, the Japanese and the American were all in Rome. And then the um, uh, Italian artist, Paolo Patelli was in Venice, whereas Aldo Schmidt was in Trento. So it was more of a, let's say, Italian collective than a Roman collective. Um, secondly, um, uh, two of the artists, Mirabel and Masha Hafif, left Rome at the end of the 70s, which kind of destabilized the work of the group. And then once a bit suddenly uh, died in 1971, they uh, very much dissolved. So um, I want to look at these individual trajectories to start and recognize what is actually going on there. So by the end, when I arrive at my conclusions, what I want to uh, suggest is that this group has actually uh, existed for a bit of a longer time, to 1967 to 1971, um, at least since 1964, and that it existed in a broader range of um, associates, friends, artists who exhibited and worked together. Um, but these uh, uh, kinds of um, um, uh, conclusions, I must say, are very provisional, given that this is the very first time I'm actually presenting this research um, in a, a systematic way. So I want to start with Abe Nobria. And as I said, he was a surrealist uh, artist, was very active during the 1930s. He was a photographer and a painter. And um, in uh, the 1940s, early 1940s and during the war, he was stationed in the Philippines. And as a kind of restarting of his career, he changed his name from Abe Yoshifumi to Abe Nobuya. And then in the 1950s started to adopt a kind of um, international presence going around uh, East Asia, uh, America and Amer Americas and, the, and Europe, taking on different um, committee assignments, um, sitting on juries for awards, et cetera, et cetera, as a representative of 
the Japanese Artists League. So in this capacity, he came to the West Balkans in the late 1950s for the first time in 1957. He was at a conference in Dubrovnik when he decided he wanted to travel around all regions of former Yugoslavia. And he did that for about four months, um, at which time he started to be really interested in these um, medieval, um, uh, medieval uh, burial uh, monuments across Bosnia and Herzegovina and to photograph them uh, over a period of two years. So in 1957 and 1958, he came back, he photographed these monuments and then uh, made this into an exhibition in Tokyo in 1959 and then in New York in 1961. So for him, the interest in the region, having traveled across Czechoslovakia, Hungary, uh, former Yugoslavia was very real and it came from this um, interest in kind of um, uh, different uh, art historical narratives. So at the point that he started to exhibit in um, Italy at the turn of the 1960s, he then took on this interest in the kind of medieval burial monuments in Bosnia and Herzegovina and started to work them into what was then being uh, called this art informel as a kind of um, uh, let's say equivalent of abstract expressionism in Europe, um, uh, um, uh, and then to apply particularly this method of encaustic painting, which meant that he mixed colors with uh, bivax and then uh, worked the canvas kind of in the color. So it is a mixed um, technique that kind of uh, presupposes sculpting in paint. So this kind of work is what uh, he started to develop immediately after this project in former Yugoslavia, and I kind of see um, different uh, connections there already emerging in his kind of decision to um, also uh, then stay on in Rome in uh, 1962. So when he did uh, move here, he um, continued to work in what was then considered uh, art and formal. He was the first uh, Japanese artist to permanently um, based himself in Rome, and um, there was already a growing community of international artists. Uh, Said Mombly is a very well known example, but there are uh, many more who either came uh, and stayed for a while or stayed uh, on. And he also uh, started to make these um, more local references in his work. So, here in this uh, painting is making a reference to the famous Toscani Beach, uh, Rosinano Salve, but he continues to work in a very uh, 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 same manner that I've just explained. In the 1964 and 1965, so pretty much leading up to the Illumination years, uh, he also started to do these experiments with artificial, very bold, uh, color schemes. And um, in these, um, he continued again to apply the same technique, but he would um, uh, work in these very um, um, bold uh, blues and reds and greens and yellows and uh, exhibiting them across Italy in Galleria del uh, Naviglio in Milan in 1964, but also in Cavallino in Venice in 1965. And at the same time, he was continuing to um, work as let's say, um, um, art manager, but also curator, writing journalism and organizing this uh, first exhibition of Italian contemporary art in Japan in 1965, where he shown work by such um, prominent figures as Manzoni, Fontana, Capograssi, Schifano, and uh, all of them. So by the moment that he starts officially, let's say, to work in the Illumination as a group, he's already done um, all of these different things. And um, when he does um, uh, join uh, forces with these much younger artists than him, him to exhibit at uh, Largentario, he changes the method of work. So he kind of goes into working with collage, with smaller scale um, uh, pictures, and changes even the color scheme, the shapes. So he starts to adopt a very different uh, mode of work. Um, this is also something he continues to work on uh, when, unfortunately, he passes away in the 1970s in a larger scale and in acrylics. And this is the kind of body of work that, unfortunately, is not as uh, uh, much exhibited uh, because of that. 
Which brings me on to the two um, artists from the former Yugoslavia, Mira Bertka and Milena Trebrakovic. And both of them came to Rome in 1959. Um, Milena Trebrakovic was already um, um, an artist, exhibiting artist, who graduated from the Belgrade Academy of Fine Art in 1953. And Mira Bertka uh, was um, a graduate from uh, uh, an Academy of Theatre and Film and enrolled in, uh, Galeria, uh, in the School of uh, Fine Art here in Rome upon her arrival, graduating in 1963. So both of them uh, were interesting because they worked across film and art worlds. And Mira Bertka, in uh, specific, she worked as a very successful, she had a career as a successful um, um, film, um, a production assistant, whereas Milena Trebrakovic worked uh, across animation and film. And they shared a studio um, in their formative years in Rome. And how they tell a story is that um, Abe came uh, by one day, knocked on the door of the studio to invite them to a show opening. And this is how they started uh, well, first uh, um, uh, just uh, kind of hanging out together and then uh, working together as well. And of course, because Bertka and Trebrakovic was so much younger and so uh, less experienced, uh, Abe was functioning very much in the kind of mentor uh, role for them. Uh, they also shown sometimes uh, together. And um, the first time they did this here in 1965, uh, they did in, uh, so in in Galleria Scorpio in Rome uh, by in, under the curation of Giuseppe Gatt in an exhibition called uh, Forme Presenti together with um, uh, Conte and Franchini and Takahashi, three other um, artists living in Rome at the time. And even in, at that moment, we can really establish kind of the very uh, uh, modes of work that they were developing in their Illumination years, working with very reduced, very um, uh, repetitive, very uh, geometric uh, abstraction and uh, adopting a certain kind Kind of color scheme as well as a preference for certain kinds of forms, uh, straight line and uh, kind of uh, spherical shapes uh, respectively. In terms of their mentorship uh, under Abe's patronage, this is something that did not just influence their work as painters, but it was also something that um, extended across what we might call the art scene in Rome and Italy at the time. And um, both Abe and especially Bertka were seen um, throughout the decade with uh, the most recognizable uh, figures in um, uh, the country at the time. Here I'm just pulling out a couple of images of them with Hans Richter, with um, uh, Lucio Fontana, and then Giulio Calargan. So th they were both uh, in their capacities as journalists and cultural producers um, going out and really uh, doing different things rather than just um, exhibiting together. So this is something also that I think is interesting when considering Illumination as a group. In terms of their individual work, um, Bertka and Trubrakovic also started to adopt very separate um, working methods towards the end of the decade. And we can see for Berka at least very clearly how this develops across different mediums in her practice. If we look at some of her drawings and some of the collages she made, we can see the kind of um, preference for repetition, for uh, a very systematic use of um, um, very stripped down kinds of motifs, but also the, let's say, merging of something we might consider as a more organic kind of abstraction and something that is normally considered as a hard edge and kind of more of a mathematical approach to this uh, mode of working. This kind of work was getting um, uh, a lot of uh, recognition or uh, it was being uh, shown and not only in Rome, but also in Yugoslavia. So in 1971, uh, Bertko had uh, a solo show at the Salon of the Museum of Contemporary of Belgrade. And this is precisely the kind of work that uh, she would show at the time, expanding the same kind of approach 
which she was developing over the Illuminacion years and in her Rome, um, in, in her time in Rome, into the kind of acrylics and um, um, uh, very um, uh, kind of um, uh, different takes on uh, a similar subject matter. Her trajectory as an artist at this point, however, uh, kind of goes in a different direction. She left Rome in 1970 to work on what was then the biggest film production in former Yugoslavia of all times. It was the film Sutjeska, which was kind of a, um, um, uh, visited by the President Tito and celebrated as the kind of um, the best production uh, ever made. And then she moved permanently to Serbia to start a family, working across film and fashion design, uh, not returning to her abstract work until the uh, late 90s. Once she did, however, this led to a very successful career towards the end of her life. And she had two retrospective exhibitions in Serbia, one in 2012 at uh, the Museum Contemporary Art of Vojvodina and another one at the um, City Museum of Belgrade, um, uh, co-mounted with the foundation of Mirabetka that just closed maybe three weeks ago. So Mirabetka is um, uh, getting kind of uh, quite uh, well recognized in the same way Abe uh, um, is because since his death, there has been a numerous um, uh, amount of shows in Japan, I must say, that celebrated uh, his work as well. For Milena Chubrakovic, the uh, story goes a little bit differently in that she starts to develop a kind of um, very unique approach to practice, uh, working in the kind of geometrical manner she developed in the Illuminacion years, but across her very unique color scheme in this very uh, repetitive manner and then expanding across uh, objects as well as um, um, kind of more wall pieces. And this is her, um, at her solo exhibition at the Salon Museum of Contemporary Art in 1973, when we can see the kind of ambition of this work and the achievement of this kind of work, especially for that time, um, where um, she's shown um, probably around 50 pieces that she made uh, during um, her uh, first 10 years in Rome. And this kind of work is interesting to, to consider also in kind of, uh, with regard to what we consider as, let's say more uh, an industrial element of this kind of practice. She was always insistent upon the fact that she needs to create this work. It wasn't kind of about stripping it from the kind of um, gesture or the hand of the artist. The process of the making is very much important to her. She writes about it and, then we can see her also kind of insisting on it in this uh, portrait picture that is seen in her catalogue um, for the solo exhibition at the Salon uh, of the Museum Contemporary of Belgrade in 1973. Um, the achievement of this work is also recognized by the fact that it was acquired by the um, Galleria Nazionale next door. So both of the uh, images we see here, the collage and the um, uh, main work uh, projection too from 1972 were acquired by them. And I think they kind of really show um, the uh, strength and the kind of achievement of her work at the time. Unfortunately, after this moment, uh, after the 70s, this uh, recognition really fizzles out. And um, after the death of President Tito in the 80, uh, 1980 and the dissolution of former Yugoslavia, she stops receiving any institutional support and then travels between Rome and Belgrade, supporting herself as an art teacher and selling commercial painting, but did not come back to abstract work before receiving receiving a grant from the Pollock Krasner Foundation in 2002, unfortunately, just two years before her passing in 2004. So just restarting this kind of work when she uh, sadly passed away. And um, unfortunately, it, it, the retrospective show and nothing of the kind still hasn't taken place, but there is a monograph um, uh, publication in preparations and hopefully uh, will not take too long to uh, come out so that we get to see more of that uh, work. In terms of Marsha Hafif's um, uh, work in Rome, she was a trained painter from California. She um, uh, graduated in 19... 
um, 51 uh, um, to begin with, but then during the 1950s, she worked as um, a high and as a primary school teacher. Then she went on uh, to do graduate studies in Renaissance painting and Japanese or uh, Oriental, as it was called at the time, um, uh, uh, visual arts, uh, which brought her to Rome on a uh, study trip in 1961 on her way to Florence. Um, and then uh, kind of having passed through Rome, she suddenly decided that she wants to stay on and then ended up staying an, uh, an entire decade because she also married and had a family here um, during that time. And um, in terms of her work um, in Rome, we can clearly notice two stages how her work develops. Firstly, it kind of develops through drawings and they are of really, again, stripped forms. They're sometimes connected to her experience of Rome um, and she writes about it as well. But mostly it is the kind of contemporary uh, culture that she is really impressed with, the kind of advertising, the certain kind of color scheme um, that she writes is simply different from her experience of living in um, uh, the States. And then in the second phase, this kind of work develops into the um, larger scale acrylics, which are always functioning in exactly the same manner with this kind of play between form and counter form into two colors and then using these very, let's say, roundish shapes, um, uh, uh, always inviting kind of projections on the uh, part of the viewer, what they might signify, but never being really uh, resolute about what they actually are. And this is precisely the kind of work that she brings to the Illumination and um, not only to the Illumination, but to all the kind of other shows um, that she had at the similar time. Um, she was somebody who was signed um, uh, um, with um, a gallery in 1964 in Rome and started La Salita and then started to um, uh, show with them. But then in the next couple of years, she had a very uh, 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 noticeable presence on uh, the Roman contemporary art scene. She was in uh, a show that Marisa Volpi curated with uh, Carla Carl and Julia Turcado in 1967. Uh, she also had a solo show in uh, at Cavallino in Venice in 1968. But then um, after her final solo show in 1969, she decided uh, that she wanted to go back uh, to the States and um, uh, to um, pursue a bit of a different um, artistic um, career. So what uh, happened to her afterwards is that she went on to study photography and did a little bit of uh, um, um, lens space medium work uh, towards the end of the 60s. And in the 70s, she moved to New York, uh, where she again returned to abstract painting, working very much in a monochrome style. So this is what she's best known of for and what she kind of continued to do in her career. But because she had such a successful career, in the States um, uh, since then, all of the kind of work in Rome was just sitting in storage. And she said she you know, made all of this, it wasn't really um, uh, commercially profitable. And when she left, she just put it in storage. So uh, the whole body of work wasn't really seen until the turn of the decade um, when it was um, first kind of emerging from private collections in Rome. And then when it was put together for um, a couple of shows in Geneva, and um, when we see the body of work like this um, in one place, it's very clear that it's an exactly the same body of work that she's shown in these different places. So the two um, uh, uh, pieces here on the far left, far left and far right are exhibited at the Illumination. And then the second from the left is from the uh, Marisa Volpi show. And the second on the right is from um, uh, the solo show at Cavallino. So it, it is exactly the same body of work Work, even the kind of um, titles are indicating precisely the kind of uh, continuity in the production 120, 127, 8, etc. So uh, this is something um, I find very interesting in terms of some of my conclusions later on. So um, 
Marsha Hafif, I think, um, uh, adds again another uh, very interesting layer because of her work with uh, Marisa Volpi. Marisa Volpi championed her um, in the 60s, but also in the 70s. She's uh, kind of uh, put um, her um, in several exhibitions that she's curated, and um, it is a very interesting trajectory, I feel, um, in that respect. When we finally arrived to the Italian members of the group, Paolo Pateri and Aldo Schmidt, um, uh, there is um, a kind of um, uh, immediately then a pattern that starts to uh, almost emerge in kind of uh, work that we see. So by now we've seen all of these kind of different practices, different trajectories, what happened to these artists during the 1960s in Rome. And um, uh, it, suddenly uh, now that we arrived to kind of the rest of the group and I'm going alphabetically, uh, by the way, um, it, it, it becomes the, the pattern and starts to kind of show. And um, in terms of Paolo Patelli's work, there are two things immediately that we can conclude. One is that he is also exhibiting in the same kinds of galleries that we've seen the other artists exhibiting. So uh, he very much emerges from a scientific background. He studied chemistry and uh, pharmacy um, at the time and then decided to pursue a career um, in art um, uh, based in Venice. And um, he worked with Cavallino Gallery, which was a very prominent um, uh, modern and contemporary art uh, gallerist um, in the city, and then across uh, with Galleria del Nevido in Milan, which is pretty much a branch of the same gallery run by two different brothers. Um, this is um, him in 1966 with um, Marsha Hafif, who also exhibited the same gallery. Um, and then the kind of work that he develops, again, takes up similar themes. It is the kind of um, uh, stripped, very reduced um, lines and dots, in his case, dotted lines, um, working with the kind of uh, spatial um, awareness in his case, and then um, uh, working in a very um, clear and very strong connection to Abe, who uh, wrote a text, a catalog text for his show at Cavallino in 1966, and who kind of um, uh, um, is very much uh, a dear figure in his uh, recollections later on. So we see also that similarly to Hafif and uh, Bertka and Chubrakovic were the younger members of the group. This is just the first kind of, um, let's say, uh, prominent body of work that these artists are producing. So it, these are the beginnings of their careers. So we can see that they're exhibiting in different places, including Illumination, exactly the same kinds of work. And um, in uh, Patelli's case, we can see the kind of crossover here with uh, modern art agency um, in Napoli, 1967. And um, uh, again, the kind of repetition, the pattern starts to emerge. For him, he continued to have a uh, very strong presence in the Italian um, uh, uh, contemporary art scene, but took a different direction uh, towards more kind of installation-based work and towards more, let's say, spatial practice, which, as we will arrive to um, very quickly, is uh, something that was very much predominant on the Italian uh, contemporary art scene at the time under the influence or the impact or kind of logic of Arte Povera. So he also started to work as a professor. He held posts in New York, in the UK, in Norwich, in Sheffield, and also um, uh, in Venice in the end, um, uh, teaching fine arts. So uh, that kind of appreciation of Abe as a teacher, I think also is something uh, worth noting here. In terms of Aldo Schmidt, um, he has had probably the strongest um, theoretical interest in this kind of play between color and light that Abe also explained. And in his case, this was um, very much the uh, kind of work that would um, inspire the, let's say, neo-constructivist or neo um, 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 uh, 
Bauhaus even kind of work in the 50s and 60s, but is also very much theorized in text. So he's somebody who would write about the kind of systemic um, play of color and light in the ideas of perception. He's somebody who philosophized his work. And in his case, the kind of pattern continues. So he's also showing with Cavallino first in 1965 and then here in 1967, but his kind of trajectory if you like, is uh, specific in that he works with this kind of almost deconstruction of the um, picture plane in which the movement or the dynamism of the kind of repetition of the elements is meant to work in a kind of movement rather than um, in kind of uh, systematic waves we've seen with Birtka. So he has a very specific kind of work, but the method of the work is very similar in that he also works with collage, he also works with drawing, and then works in larger scales on canvas and acrylic. So this kind of, let's say, multi-medium approach to practice where different ideas are teased in different um, ways is what also, I think, unites uh, uh, different members of Illumination is uh, certainly an aspect here that um, uh, uh, could be uh, studied at greater length. In his case, in the 1970s, he really continues into what was then considered um, analytical painting or even um, was considered as uh, objective abstraction and his kind of um, um, uh, dedication to it is really well received and really well recognized but suddenly he uh, passed away um, in a, a, a boat accident in 1978 so his career was cut short. Um, so that very much gives you the summary of different artists there. And I just want to recap and summarize maybe some of those points now that we know all of those different trajectories and kind of bring us back to the beginning when we said that this is meant to be just 1967 to 1971, um, in that it is also 1960s not only in Italy, but in the world. So this kind of time is something I also um, want to address at least to some extent to help us contextualize the work of these artists. And when we talk about this period in Italy, of course, 1968, 1960s in general are the time when Italian miracle of the 1950s is over, 1960s are much more politically turbulent. And in the 1968, of course, everything explodes around the world, including Italy. And this translates directly into the art world. So the, the kind of, let's say, repercussions of 1968 are not superficial, they're very real. Um, in the Venice Biennial um, in 1968, there are protests, there are police arrests, there are um, artists who are boycotting the police presence in the Giardini and uh, Gastone Novelli is one of them here turning away his canvases and writing um, this very bold statement, La Biennale Fascista, saying that they resist kind of the um, um, uh, policing of uh, the event. And, um, the importance here is that the whole tide of what is art, what is considered art, what is considered as, um, let's say, use, not useful, but what is considered as meaningful in terms of art practice changes a lot. So in 1967, rather than this kind of more so arte programmata or this kind of, let's say, color based, very um, um, visual uh, means of work, the political kind of impactful uh, arts practice starts to dominate. Arte Povera uh, arises at exactly the same time, 1967, and in 1968, uh, uh, you know, picks up all the accolades only to uh, become probably the best known um, um, momentum in uh, uh, Italian uh, contemporary art practice, practice at the time. So a lot of these discourse, a lot of these um, practices, a lot of these stories, if you like, really get lost in the kind of dominance of Arte Povera in a similar manner, we could argue, as the kind of art um, uh, historical narrative around uh, abstract expressionism then uh, makes all the other various uh, art practices around the world similarly uh, not necessarily disappear but become less 
um, apparent. So when you speak about the 1960s and this group of people, it is definitely not only illumination that we speak about when we speak about the kind of work that is being made. And this hopefully in the kind of patterns that I've started to chart out for you becomes recognizable, but I'm pulling out just a couple of more examples to maybe convince you further. And um, an important element there is to recognize then Patelli and Abe exhibited together also as part of a really well-known international national but Europe-based mostly group of artists called Zero uh, Avant-Garde. They exhibited together in 1965 in Fontana Studio in Milan. Um, uh, Marisa Volpi that we've just mentioned curated Imagini del Colore with Hafifa Cardi Turcado also um, um, curated a show between Bertka Gencha and Franchini um, at Scorpio in 1964 in Rome. So we get another parallel and an extended or expanded group of people even. Um, um, uh, then in uh, Forme Presenti, we also have other artists and across Cavallino and Avilio, there were groups or other artists who were working in a similar manner who would be exhibited and working in a similar manner at these artists. And um, I'm just um, uh, pulling out this one example from uh, Cavallino in 1967, when Patelli would exhibit uh, with a lot of these artists and Abella uh, Georgie among them. So my interest here also is kind of in women artists. So we can see, um, let's say, Carla Cardi being mentioned together with uh, Genchai um, Kasabci, a Turkish artist, and then uh, another not so well recognized Italian woman artist, Annabella Giorgi, there also in the extended group of people, not to mention um, uh, uh, lots and lots of more that um, I don't have time to uh, address. So what I'm trying to maybe suggest is that when we speak about Illumination, we are of course speaking about this very uh, concrete and very um, uh, uh, well uh, recognized group of people, but that it is a very good case study to then start to create a different narrative, to break some of those maybe narratives that are uh, being uh, lost to um, uh, um, art history because of the kind of predominant maybe uh, presence of Arte Povera on the scene. In terms of politics, uh, I think it is also an interesting uh, group to consider. They are not politically activist, but they are very um, directly um, affiliated or aligned with certain groups of people. So Carla Cardi and Julia Tercado on one hand side, uh, Fontana on the other, and kind of um, across Italy, they are, um, um, let's say, those people who are working on on the scene, but not kind of in a political active manner. So um, there is something I think also interesting to think about that when we think about um, uh, Illumination as a group. Finally, what I want to finish is not to suggest that, okay, these are the people that have been uh, less recognized in our history, so we should look at them more, which of course I am, but also that there is something very maybe uh, specifically or uniquely Italian in terms of not only uh, art historical lineages, and as we've seen in case of Abe, but also in case of other artists like Tugrakovic and Bertka, um, something uh, uh, um, in in criticism and in kind of approach to art that is actually uh, making this kind of work not only possible but also meaningful. So to finish my talk I just want to chart maybe some of the connections between these artists and let's say it's an expanded Illumination group with the Italian art criticism in the 1960s because these artists not only worked in direct relationships with each other and with the gallery scene in Rome and in Italy, they worked directly with Italian critics who were uh, um, uh, prominently working um, in Italy at the time. And in terms of Umberto Eco's uh, opera Aperta from 1962, um, Hafiv speaks in her interviews how she met Eco uh, on the launch of his book in Rome in 1962, and that this idea of an open artwork, which is deliberately inviting interpretation from the point of view of viewer, is not superficially then retrospectively inserted into her work, but develops together with his ideas. And he recognized her work in these terms uh, also in his recollection. So they're not kind of um, uh, superficially put together, but they're working through similar ideas in different ways, um, him in criticism and her in um, artistic practice. 
for Filberto Mena, who is um, uh, also a very well-known Italian art critic, um, uh, the author of La Venia Analytica, the Arte Moderna from 1975. He included Paolo Patel in two of his major shows in the 1960s, Impatto Percettivo in 1967, as well as Struttura e Colore in 1968. So again, the connection is there direct. And uh, this kind of idea of analytical approach to art is we've seen something Patel um, is interested in, but um, uh, for uh, Mena, he's working in a kind of more broader international scene, as was the case study in the Impatto Percettivo, as well as in kind of Italian context as in Struttura e Colore. For Giuseppe Gatt, uh, who curated and wrote uh, a number uh, of uh, texts for um, exhibition catalogs, including his uh, La Nuova Maniera Italiana in 1986. He wrote uh, for Galleria Scorpio in the Forno Presenti and also wrote about Chubrakovic's work later in her solo exhibitions in Yugoslavia. So again, the connection is really uh, real. And then last but not least, uh, for Giulio Carlo Argan, he is a super important point of reference to Abe. He is somebody whose uh, book in 1988, L'arte moderna dall'illuminismo ai movimenti contemporanei, suggests a direct lineage from the kind of tradition of illuminated um, tradition of medieval manuscripts in Europe into the contemporary art. Um, he is somebody who's written a book on English. Um, illuminated manuscripts in 1963, so probably inspiring Abe as well to adopt this reference. He's somebody who wrote two text catalogues for Abe in 1962 and 1964, and included him in Altra Informale in 1963, invited him to Avezzano for Struttura Divisione, which was a big conference uh, on kind of art theory at the time, and they both take took part at the San Marino conference in 1965, which is probably the best known moment in kind of um, uh, let's say critical theory of Italian uh, 1960s, really promoting this idea of non-figurative uh, color-based um, um, art um, as a kind of um, um, meaningful um, uh, way of work in a kind of tradition longer than what we consider this kind of, uh, let's say 20th century art historical narrative. Thank you. 